Well, welcome. I'm so glad you're here. I'm Catherine Palin, and I work with Elder Care Ministries for the American Baptist Churches of Rhode Island. And this is part of a series that we're doing that we call Art and Aging. And it features outstanding artists who are in the third, third of life. And today we are so fortunate to have as our featured artist Ann Winthrop Corden, an award-winning painter, as well as an art uh, author. And she's going to be exploring today with us painting and the creative life. And so Ann, if you want to unmute yourself, we'll do a little bit of talking before we then show some of your paintings. And I love reading the way you describe your relationship with art as a timeline that allows you to tell your story. At the very beginning of your memoir, Into the Light, you wrote, some say the past is best left in the past. Some say we can and must learn from our mistakes. Some say we're as sick as our secrets. Some say we will not regret the past. And I ask, what do you say? So I would ask, what do you say? Oh, Catherine, thank you. Hey, everyone. So great to be here today. And I appreciate you asking me so much for this, Catherine. Um, I met you at Central Baptist Church when you came in 2007, and you were with us in until uh, 2014. So uh, we go back a ways. And one thing I always loved about you and well, still do is how in your, um, in your sermons and, and just in talking with you, the references to, to art, to film, to literature, I really felt in you a big kindred spirit and all of those things. And so, um, in 2008, I was asked to talk about art at Central Baptist Church. And it's so funny because um, I found on my computer, you know, what I had written for that talk because I was very nervous and I had to have like a script. And, um, and, and today I don't have a script. So <laughs> we'll just see. Um, but yes, the, the timeline that, um, you found those words about the timeline in my um, artist statement on my website. And I think of, you know, my very, very early connections uh, to art and, you know, just how as a kid, I was always drawing, always, you know, lost in a book, always, um, you know, appreciating things. And, you know, we moved to uh, uh, France when I was 10, my dad was in the Navy and we got taken to so many, uh, fabulous uh, museums and cathedrals and and places and we were just exposed to so much and sometimes I was bored but a lot of times I was just pretty fascinated and <clears throat> I enjoyed looking and I enjoyed um, you know just observing uh, people as well as art so I just had a, a lot of interests and I mean, I, I'm still kind of that way. I, sometimes I feel I need to reel myself in. I remember someone at one time told me I was a dilettante. And, you know, I, I took offense, but I really didn't know what a dilettante was. And I had to go to a dictionary and look it up and um, basically meant that, you know, you had your finger in everything, but you, you really weren't a master at anything. And I thought, oh, well, that's true with me. Um, that's definitely true with me. Um, but you know, that uh, journey, that, um, that timeline of art, um, it got really interrupted for me because I got exposed as a lot of teenagers do to alcohol and drugs. For me, um, <clears throat> I never had that uh, normal kind of experimentation and then move on, like wise up and get with it. I just went into like full blown alcoholism and drug addiction, which really led me to some dark places, uh, as well as being, you know, like a tremendous disappointment to, you know, my parents who had, you know, little understanding of how to help me, how to reach me, how to um, 
you know, really fix me. It's like, we want to fix these people. Uh, can't they see? But you know what? I was um, really into myself and what I was doing. And, uh, you know, alcohol and drugs made a lot of choices for me, or I made a lot of choices for myself under the influence. And so, uh, you know, I, I did have a lot of things that I regret. And when I wrote that memoir in, in um, you know, like two years ago, I, I thought about that question about how many of us have, and I, I think I can speak generally, how many of us have those things in our past that we're not particularly proud of, and we'd rather like keep, let's keep those skeletons in the closet. And I know many families are just raised with, you know, we're not talking about that stuff. And so it becomes kind of the elephant in the room. But, you know, when I got into recovery, when I was 26 years old, I just learned that the only way um, that I would actually heal from my past was to take a deep dive, to get fearless, and to really investigate, to try to find out, you know, what had, motiv what had really motivated me. And um yeah, so when in doing that, I was able to make peace. I was able to learn a lot of things about myself and make peace with my past. I was able to, you know, forgive myself. And for things that had happened, um, some things that I felt like I had no control over, other things that, you know, I was just plunging self will right in, trying to do it my way. So I, um, you know, return to art, uh, probably, um, you know, a couple of years before I got sober, I got real interested in jewelry making. And I took a lot of classes. I actually lived in, in Manhattan and studied at the Gemological Institute of America, diamond setting and jewelry repair. And it was, um, it was phenomenal. You know, that's when I was pregnant with Jessica, my daughter's here today. Um, and I, and I was like, so I'm kind of an all or nothing person. And so when I was taking those classes, it was like I was single minded. But after my children were born and she was followed by um, a set of twins, my artistic endeavors became more of the household variety. You know, so I did a lot of home sewing. I did a lot of needlepoint. I did a lot of cooking back then. And my garden was a huge sense of um, you know, creativity and art, artistic expression. And it wasn't until I was 50, so that's probably the third third of my life, um, that I decided to take up, you know, formal uh, art with a pen, with, a, with some paints. And I was uh, on vacation in Santa Barbara <clears throat> and uh, I was having a lot of physical the limitations. I wasn't, um, my back was a problem. I couldn't go hiking. My shoulder was a problem. I couldn't go golfing. So I decided to go to the art supply store and, and pick up some materials. And I brought them back to the hotel. And the hotel had a courtyard with a lovely fountain. And I had all my materials and I sat there. And I had in my head, I had this image that I was going to paint. And um, I couldn't go, I didn't come close. And it was so, like, it was kind of a little bit ego deflating because I really thought I would be able to do it because I thought I could draw pretty well when I was younger. Uh, but when I got back to Rhode Island, I started taking a class, a drawing class actually in Jamestown at the Community Art Center. Uh, after that, I took um, classes at the Newport Art Museum and the Coleman Center. And then I went to, you know, a college class. And as I said, I like to get all in and I wanted to learn everything that I could. And I didn't want to be a dilettante anymore. I wanted to learn how to paint with oil paint. And people were going off in different directions with the cold wax mediums, with the pastels, with the watercolor. And I just said, no, I'm going to put my blinders on. And I'm going to learn everything I can about oil paint and, uh, and, and just see, just see where it takes me. So yeah, that's about up to now. Right. Well, um, that's a great segue. I think, would you like to, for us to show some of your paintings so you could talk then sort of about each of the paintings or however you want to do it, but also about your kind of connection with that. So let me get. Unless anybody has a question right off the bat. 
or we'll wait till the end. Yeah, let's wait till the end. How about that? Okay, that's so fine. Let me. All right. <sighs> so, Anne, can you see? I can see you, and I can see my painting. Okay. So, shall we start there? Let's start there. All right. This painting was after I had been painting about five years and I had um, entered, I had joined the Newport Art Museum and I had entered their annual member show, which actually was kind of hard to get into, but they did pick this painting uh, with a kind of a weird title, Dreamscape to Play. It's a playground down on Ruggles Avenue, but then in the back there's a Ferris wheel. And so it had all kinds of elements all thrown together. You can see I'm in love with color and I'm in love with shapes. So that's pretty much been a constant. Um, and while that museum, I mean, while that piece was in the Newport Art Museum at that member show in 2005, I received a letter from a man who was a president of the um, Portsmouth Arts Guild inviting me to join that organization. So all of a sudden it was like, oh, now I can be with other artists. So that was extremely exciting to me. So while I was at the um, Portsmouth Arts Guild, I, uh, I just started out as, as being a regular member. And then I uh, got onto the exhibition committee, which was really exciting hanging shows and um, just being involved with the intake of art and meeting all of the artists. Uh, they were not only from Portsmouth, but they were all around Rhode Island and Southern Mass. And it was fantastic to be a part of that. And I did have an opportunity to have a three person show uh, there. And this is one of the paintings from that show. It's like a larger painting, it's 30 by 30. And I had taken uh, photographs when we were traveling. And this is from uh, the Riverwalk in San Antonio. So it's got multiple figures, again, lots of color and uh, yeah, ready to order. This is another painting that um, was in that show, that three member show. This is a, a big, each one of those panels is 30 by 30 and it's the Starbucks down in Newport and they have a second floor, uh, where there's tables and I sat up there and I did some sketches and uh, I think, uh, and then I, I, of course I took some photographs and I worked on that at home. And uh, as you can see uh, on the left-hand side is the empty chair. So I have had a fascination with empty chairs for a long time. Um, and so it's just showing up in, in this work. Ah, so this is, this is that, here's the thing that's so cool is that every single painting, I can put myself exactly where I was when it happened. And this one was a summer morning uh, when it gets right, light really early. So first light was probably at 5 a.m. and I was down at um, Third Beach and I got that sunrise uh, facing east, you know, on Aquidneck Island in, in uh, Newport. So that was, uh, I'd begun to paint outside with different people. Um, plein air painting, very, very old tradition. You got to put up with uh, oh, bugs and no bathroom and you forgot your paper towels or whatever it is. There's, uh, it could be wind, your easel could get blown over, your painting could fall in the sand. Um, but in any event, it's, uh, it was, a great and still continues to be a wonderful source of uh, painting for me, that direct observation being like in the scene and taking it all in. It's so different from painting in the studio and yet it informs all the painting that I do do in the studio. So I, I've been pretty involved with the Newport Art Museum and every year they have a fundraiser called Wet Paint. And this is just in my friend's uh, driveway and we set, um, so we painted plein air. We set the flowers up, they fell over, we had to tie them to the fence. And so this, this one went into the auction at the, it's a, it's a summer fundraiser for the, uh, for the museum. And I've done it every year. Last year was the first year 
probably because of COVID that um, you know, I haven't done it in quite a long time. Here's another uh, Newport Art Museum wet paint painting. And this one, uh, I, uh, I had a, a partial knee replacement about eight years ago. And this was done about two weeks after uh, my, my knee replacement. And my friend came over to me and we just painted where we were. I wasn't traveling. I wasn't going anywhere to paint. And I probably painted sitting down. So anyway, you and me, a couple of chairs. A few years later, I was um, invited, uh, actually, it was a, a jurying process to be part of this um, plein air festival up in Castine, Maine. And I was, you know, thrilled to be accepted. <coughs> and it was a five day festival. I painted every day. I stayed at a wonderful family. Um, they were my host family. And this is just a, a small painting. Uh, the whole thing culminated in a wonderful sale. And it was just a, an amazing experience to be around that many, you know, well over 100 painters in that little town, all in different places on the streets and the beaches. And yeah, it was a great experience. And of course, Beaver Tail, Jamestown, Rhode Island, home, very, lived there for many, many years. Uh, just another view down very abstract foreground down in the um, below it and looking up. I, I like to look at things, you know, from a different perspective instead of straight on. So this one was definitely looking up at the, the buildings, the lighthouse. Another plein air piece, this is, we were out in Santa Barbara and um, it was funny because there was a painting workshop going on at the same time and the people were all set up uh, painting the mission except for one guy and he had turned around and he was painting this house and I the more I you know I was like looking first I'd look at the mission and then I'd look at that house he was painting and I thought you know what I really like that red tile roof it's so California Spanish style I painted that oh this one um this is a copy this is a very small painting uh, after Edward Hopper. And I have been, you know, influenced by, well, obviously a, a lot of different uh, 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 painters. Edward Hopper, you know, was an early love as was, I mean, Matisse and Cezanne when I was a kid, uh, Fairfield Porter, um, Viard. And I think now with, um, with social media, and being able to go on Instagram, I have discovered so many new painters and so many wonderful painters, but the practice of copying a, a work of art, well, when I did study formally and I was at the um, uh, Mass College of Art, one of our assignments was we had to go to the uh, Museum of Fine Arts and pick a painting. Of course, you can't paint in the museum. So you had to do sketches and make color notes. And, and I did an Edward Hopper, it's quite a large painting of um, the girl in the window in Brooklyn and learned so much from that. Um, this one is a little, I did a bunch of these, uh, the, that same flower. I turned it one direction looking west I turned it the other way, looking east, uh, just like one little glass bottle, one black mug and that flower. And uh, so again, it's a small painting. I was involved for quite a long time, just painting small and painting often and painting uh, always from direct observation, either a flower or a seashell or a teacup or just something um, you know, that I could just set in front of me and paint. Um, usually in an hour to two hours max. Oh, this is a big painting that, um, I, I, and I can't remember where the photograph was taken. I know I was walking my dog and it was in a uh, state park and I just was taken by the reflections in the water. And I remember that we saw deer that morning and it was an early morning walk. And this is a big painting that lives in North Carolina now. 
again, the flowers, um, those, um, you know, that, that combination of that yellow and blue and white, you know, that just reminds me of my mom. Those were like some of her favorite color combinations. And while I'm painting it, um, I'm just thinking about her and it's just, uh, I love that connection to, to memory that, that painting can give you, whether it's a piece of fabric or, and even the sort of edge up in that upper right hand corner and down on the bottom right hand corner is sort of my ode to Matisse. I was thinking about Matisse when I was painting. Um, this one is my sister's. So again, we're talking about memory and we're talking about really, really familiar things. That is my grandmother's house. It's where my sister lives now in Jamestown. She looks right over at Newport, but I got Newport out of the way and just had a, a clear horizon because I can do that. Uh, the, the chair was my grandmother's chair. The pillow was a needlepoint pillow I did. Uh, but I like, uh, you know, all that, just all the memories. And, and, you know, when I started that painting, I went freehand with that floor and I thought, Oh, you know, I can, I can paint, a, you know, a, a floor like that. And I'm telling you, I had to do that floor like four times. And I had to like get out the ruler and I had to look up some stuff on perspective. And, and so my ego, it was like a little struggle in there. And it's just, um, it was fun <laughs> and not fun. <laughs> I painted, this is down at the State Pier in Newport where all the fishermen are, the, all the working fleet. And I've painted down there plein air so many times. And I also, there's a, an American flag dead center and you're not supposed to put anything. That's one of the rules of composition. Don't put anything dead center, but I put that American flag dead center with that spot of red below it. That was a red bucket that was up the mast on another boat. And I just, uh, yeah, I love painting those boats. I love, um, you know, being in that environment, just, it's kind of stinky uh, with all the bait and you'd see the boats come in and it's just um, completely envelop you with uh, the scene. Uh, this was taken over, I think I was out painting that day. And uh, this is out in, I think it was, I um, can't think of the place now, but I was, um, they were having a sailing lesson, Fort Adams, it was at Fort Adams. And I was just fascinated by uh, the water. And I just, uh, this is a pretty big painting. Uh, it's like, I think it's 24 by 48. And I was just fascinated by the, the movement in the water. And how can I capture that? How can I, how can I paint this? I love that kind of challenge. So we've been going to uh, South Carolina the last few years and we are on Hilton Head Island. So every day Cooper gets a walk on the beach and we're up and down the beach, usually at the same time of the day. So the tides are always different. Sometimes there's a lot of tidal pools. Sometimes, uh, you know, the tide is high. But I started doing, I did a series of paintings for a new gallery that I'm in, Camellia Art in Hilton Head Island. And this was one that's titled Day Starters. And this is just, I named that kind of after the idea of, you know, every day is a fresh day, a, a new start. I can just leave yesterday behind and just have a clean slate uh yeah just for today the day starters this is actually um my deck in in the house i'm in right now in portsmouth and it kind of combines everything that i've really been interested in um again you've got a chair you've got some flowers you've got the water and then the patterns of the uh, pergola just putting all those elements together that I uh, 
that I really enjoy. I painted this from direct observation over, you know, several sessions and it was um, used as the uh, promotional piece when I had a uh, show at the Dryden Gallery in Providence last summer, a COVID show. <laughs> anyway. And this one, Ebb Tide. This is a big painting. This was a commission. It was commissioned to me uh, from a smaller painting. And I was, I painted it in the month of February while we were traveling. And it was very challenging because I didn't have a studio. I'm in the motorhome. The painting's big, it's 36 by 36. And so I have a lot of, um, you know, uh, struggle as to, you know, how I'm gonna paint this. It, at one point it was bungee corded to a chair and I'm sitting on a yoga mat and painting on the ground. Another time it actually got finished in our bathroom laying across the double vanity with sheets to protect everything. Um, so all of those memories, but I wanted to, uh, this is again, one of the, from the foreground going back, there's a tidal pool. And then that gold is just a crazy looking sky that morning is just, it's really magnificent to me what, when you're out there and you're looking around and just nature and, and, and the, the magnificent show that we have in, in nature all around us, whether it's at the seashore or any other place. It's just, um, so that's what I wanted to capture with those bold, bold colors. Dramatic piece. Um, th this one was done just a couple of months ago. I, um, while we were in South Carolina, I, I joined up a few times with the uh, plein air painters of Savannah. And we went out to, uh, that's the Skidaway River. And it's like, oh, the live oaks and the Spanish moss. Let me try to get that. Just so I remember everything about that day. Um, th this is a big piece. This is the biggest piece I've done to date. It was the one Catherine has, uh, we're using for the, the promotion for this talk today. It's called Ebb Tide. It's, um, again, I painted it with a deadline going to the gallery in South Carolina before I left South Carolina. And uh, I had a lot of, uh, I don't know, I had a lot of struggle at the beginning with this painting and it was, I had to actually prey on this painting because I was, I felt like lost. I don't know if it was the size of it or that sky just felt so big. Uh, I just felt the immensity of the whole scene that I just, I felt very small painting that. And I, I, I did pray quite a few times when I, before I picked up my brush, you know, just asking that creative force to direct me, show me where to put down the paint. And, and this is the last painting of this um, slideshow and it's called Solidarity. And I guess you could call it my, the sort of the culmination of this past year, uh, you know, COVID-19, the whole pandemic, all the political, unrest, all the change, all the anxiety, Black Lives Matter, all the pain, all the loss, all the suffering. Oh, it's just so overwhelming when I look at it and, and feeling it and living through it. And so I return to the things that comfort me, the ocean, <laughs> the sky, and then the two chairs together, you know, symbolizing you know, the hope and, and, and just love. So that's it, Catherine, for the paintings. Well, and before we open it up for questions and answers with everyone, that's so beautiful. You talk a lot about the importance of a creative life. So I wonder if you could talk about what leading a creative life has meant to you 
and if you have any advice or suggestions how other people might lead a creative life. Um, leading a creative life, I have changed the way that I've thought about it, that I think about it, because when I was uh, younger, it was always about uh, what you could produce, what you could show. If you're creative, there's got to be a product or at least um, something that you can show for it. I don't mean a product to sell, but something to show for it. And I've come to, and so that's what I strove for. You know, let me, you know, I remember when I learned how to make um, challah, the Jewish braided bread. And oh my, my bread, my braids had to be just right. You know, it had to be perfect. And so a lot of my creative efforts were very linked up into perfectionism. And I find that that's not to my advantage anymore, uh, not at all. So I have to expand my view of creativity and think more about how I can be uh, open to situations, how I can uh, be inspired by things that might not normally inspire me. And, and I think that I was very uh, narrow-minded in what I thought a creative life was. I, it, I just had like an image in my mind of what I thought it looked like. And once I was able to kind of let go of all my old ideas of what I thought I needed to be or you needed to be or what it should look like, and honestly ask for direction from that great creative force in the universe, um, things became much, much easier. And I could see like small, small things. Like down on my beach, there's a beach in front of my house on Macquarie Point and around the corner of the beach, someone had started putting shells because a lot of shells wa wash up and they hang the shells on the tree. And so it's just a bare, it's a winter tree with whelks hung all over the branches. And so I can look at it and say, that's cool. I like that. Take a picture of it, which I did all that stuff. But then I hunted around a little bit and I found a shell and added my shell onto the tree. So that's how it's looking for me today. Um, but also living a creative life has one aspect, which I do have to mention that's not a, a popular aspect and it's that of discipline. And I always wanted to have a lot of things without putting in a lot of effort. And so when that, when I did that first painting back in, and it was 2000 when I started a formal education of art painting, um, you know, I, I, I was so disappointed in myself, but I don't know, I had some kind of desire or willingness to just put in the hours to just do what it takes to get good uh, or at least accomplished. Uh, I wanted to learn my materials. I wanted to learn how those materials worked. So I would just say that, you know, the only advice I would give is that just allow yourself to make a lot of messy messes or things that you don't think are pretty and just keep playing and experimenting and and stop the judging because God knows I did that for a long time. I think maybe the third third of life I can ease up on myself a little bit on the judgmentalism and just let a process evolve, but practice. Great. Well, we're gonna open it up for folks who might have questions and I'll just ask you to unmute yourself and you can ask Anne your question and we'll give her then a chance to respond. Jenny Bradley. Go ahead, Jenny. Um, I'd like to ask Anne, first of all, just wonderful. Your complimentary colors are marvelous. Uh, I was wondering how you came to feel your own style. Were there certain uh, aspects that helped you to concentrate on those beautiful shapes and the uh, sh the use of shadows that that really was wonderful. Uh, your use of colors and your shadows and your um, 
in your blocks, your block uh, shapes of uh, geometric shapes. Did anything particular drive you or did you experiment? You must be a painter yourself. A little bit. Yeah, uh -huh. A little bit. I thought so. Well, uh, Jenny, I know that um, I had to learn uh, about color. I didn't have a clue. I mean, I knew that, you know, yellow and red make orange, but I, I had a whole bunch of tubes of yellow and a whole bunch of tubes of orange. So I did a lot of color charts. Um, I would, I really enjoy, I still enjoy, I did a color chart last week. Uh, I just pick up different tubes of paint and, and I mix colors to just see what I can do. I also started with a very, very limited palette. I'm talking, when I went to art school at the Lyme Academy, we were allowed one yellow, one red, one blue and white. And for me to even branch out after that, I felt like it was a sacrilege, but, um, and, and the shapes, I just, I, I was I was just taught don't blend don't blend just put the paint down and move on to the next stroke so it, it's a discipline and practice. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions. <clears throat> Meredith, and I noticed as I was watching over the various slides, eventually I started to notice the angles, and it's sort of like the geometric shapes and how you use them in a sky where you don't expect to find an angle or on the beach in the water where you don't expect to find an angle. And it was very effective. Thank you, Meredith. I'm interested in that kind of stuff. And sometimes at the very beginning of a painting, I will just divide it up. Let's say if it's four feet, wide, I'll divide it into one foot sections and then I'll do all kinds of intersecting lines and I'll just see because I'm looking for a focal point and I'm also looking for all those different kind of angles. I want to try to look at it in a different way. And I know there's so many really, really wonderful plein air painters. And when they go out and paint and, and I see their, I have painted with them, but you also see them on Facebook and Instagram and they have their painting up there next to the scene and you can't tell where the real scene leaves off and their painting begins. And I'm kind of in awe of those painters, but that's not how I wanna paint. I wanna paint it from, you know, inside out almost. Thanks. Other questions? Well, and if folks in Rhode Island or near Rhode Island wanted to see some of your work in person, where might they be able to see that? Well, in Rhode Island, um, I'm at, I'm an artist member at Spring Bowl Gallery, which is in Newport, Rhode Island. It's a, a co-op gallery. And there's some really wonderful artists there, all different mediums. And um, yeah, so I'm represented by them in Jamestown. I have work at the Fuller Gallery uh, right on Narragansett Avenue. She's a frame shop as well. And she's got like fabulous gifts, Victoria Corey. That's a, a really nice a gallery in Jamestown. And I'm also up at the uh, Dryden Gallery in Providence. It's Providence Picture Frame and they just relocated. They have a big, gorgeous gallery space. Great, thanks. But things have changed a lot, Catherine, because of the pandemic and people are actually looking at art online. Um, people are purchasing art online and it's just expanded so much. So we aren't as dependent on a physical location but nothing's better than seeing it for real. Right, right. Well, I wanna thank everyone for joining us today for another one of these fabulous programs. And, and I can't thank you enough for sharing both your paintings, but more importantly, yourself um, and your life with us. So thank you. Um, it has been really tremendous. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you for having me. Thanks. And thanks everybody for joining in.